Hey, hey, what do you say? John McLean with Open Action, presented by Armscore here, and we are in the Armscore Rock Island booth. So we're going to talk about some of the new products um, that we have released here at Armscore, and we're going to start with the one that I know you all want me to talk about, which is the 5.0 from RIA USA. Now, the version I have here is one of the limited edition versions that comes ready with the red dot from Seymour. Uh, we also do have the Iron Sight version. Now, which one, if I had to pick what I want to go with, um, personally, I actually would find myself more partial to the iron sights, but that's the competition shooter in me that's always been shooting iron sights for years and years and years. However, however, the Red Dot world is coming. They are here to stay. They've come with a force uh, to be reckoned with. And the thing I can say about a Red Dot optic when it comes to shooting firearms, uh, especially when it comes to training someone who might be brand new to the world of firearms, one of the plus sides, uh, plus sides that I find to using a red dot optic for something like that is the fact that what you do is you help eliminate a lot of the stress that comes with the actual act of aiming with iron sights. There's already so much going on through a new shooter's head when we're trying to teach them how to fire a firearm that when you add in the make sure the front side is lined up with the rear side, it's even, blah, 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 all that stuff, it just adds more stress, pressure, thinking that that person has to go through. So one of the benefits I will definitely say to going with the red dot version of this would be for the fact that all those brand new shooters, all those family members that you want to bring out to the range and train and practice with, a red dot is a great way to get them to focus on the one thing that really, really, truly does matter when it comes to shooting a firearm, and that is trigger control. If they just put the dot somewhere on the target and focus only on the trigger, then they're going to have a lot more success when it comes to breaking those shots off and hitting the target where the dot was aimed at, so that's definitely going to be a plus. With the 5.0, the other thing that I find is going to be very helpful for those people that are getting brand new into shooting is the fact that the trigger on this thing is very light, it's very crisp, and it just kind of rolls through the brake until the gun goes off. So it helps eliminate a lot of the anticipation that you might feel from some of those other triggers where there's that definitive wall before the shot breaks. This way, with it kind of being light, crisp, and then kind of rolls through, it kind of helps eliminate that that builds up tension that happens right before that shot breaks. So, for those of you that are interested in the 5.0, note that the iron sight version is is uh, up and selling, is up and selling, if I knew how to talk here. Uh, up and selling, the retail price on that is $9.98, and then when we get to the red dot version, which comes with the Seymour red dot attached, that's gonna be at $12.98 for the retail price there. But, with that being said, Let's go look at some of the other products that we have to offer here at Rock Island Armory. All right, so we just got done talking about the 5.0, and that's going to be on the higher end of the price spectrum. Let's drop to the opposite end of that spectrum, where we get into some of the more uh, cost-effective methods when it comes to training, uh, shooting, and bringing those entry-level shooters into the world of the firearms. And that's where we come to the, 22, uh, the TM-22 Featherweight. So we had the original TM-22 that we launched about a year and a half, two years ago now, super successfully. The trigger on it was very nice. The heavy rifle, being that it's all metal from front to back, helps eliminate a lot of the uh, muzzle flip, recoil impulse, everything. So as far as junior shooters go, you throw a bipod on the front of that rifle, put the junior shooter behind it, and just let them pull the trigger and plink, and it was fun for the whole family. With this version, however, you get all those same kind of benefits except there is one huge benefit that comes with the Featherweight, and that is the price point. This gun retails for $199, okay? So for $199, you're able to introduce a brand new generation of shooter without having to come out of pocket um, with a lot of, lot of uh, right up upfront cash. It ships with 10 round mags. We have 15 and 25 round mags available for this particular model. Um, you can also teach them the traditional sight picture of your standard AR-15, M4s, and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's really good when you talk about just the very absolute basic necessities of what a shooter needs to learn. However, if you don't want to do the traditional sight picture, because again, I'm a fan of red dots, all you got to do is take out the screw, slide the uh, A2 style handle, ha uh, carry handle off, and then you have the rail on the bottom so you can attach any sort of red dot optic um, that you would like to put on this rifle. Uh, you also have the adjustable stock, so for those that differ in body size, 
Um, you can adjust the length of pull, you can adjust the cheek well. There's just a lot of options that come with this gun at a price point of $199. So that's the opposite side of the spectrum from the Rock Island Armory Firearms with the TM22 Featherweight. Oh, let's not forget, we talked about that silencer shop. We've talked about suppressors. This comes all ready uh, to mount a direct thread, half by 28 thread pitch suppressor on it. So for those of you that take my advice, go to Silencer Shop, buy yourself a 22 suppressor, and then you go to Rock Island Armory or you go to your local dealer and buy yourself a TM22 Featherweight, then you can throw that suppressor on the end of this gun and then you can talk about a really good time because these things get super quiet. So uh, the TM22 Featherweight from RIA is um, another thing for you guys to check out. And uh, let's go talk about one more product. All right, now the last product I want to talk to you is a brand new product that we're launching here at Rock Island Armory, and that is going to be another addition to our BBR or the Baby Rock series. So we had the 3.10 that was available in 45 ACP. We've relaunched with a new model where it's the same look, it's the same size, same features. However, this is going to be in 9 millimeter instead of 45 ACP. I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. Those guys that shoot 45, the only reason they shoot 45 is because they don't make a 46. However, while I'm a fan of 45, I also am a fan of having a caliber that is a little bit more uh, controllable along a wider field of people because I love letting people shoot my firearms and some smaller people with the grip strength that's just not there. 45 is kind of a lot to handle. And then you throw a subcompact in their hand to 45 and yet they end up YouTube famous, which we don't want to have, okay? So you've got the nine millimeter version. Now, one of the things to note in the difference between the 310 45 ACP versus the 310 9 millimeter model. The 45 ACP had uh, porting on the barrel and the slide to help with the recoil uh, muzzle flip reduction. Um, and because of that, we had to go with a flat black front sight because when we tried the fiber optic front sight, that porting sent the gas right over the fiber optic, which melted it, and then you ended up losing your fiber optic out of the front sight anyway. However, with the 9mm, because it's a much more tame round and you don't have to fight that muzzle flip nearly as hard, we were able to throw that fiber optic front sight back on the front of the firearm. So now you have that good, crisp, clean front sight picture that we all know and love. Now, whether or not you like orange or yellow or green or red, whatever kind of fiber it is that you like, personally, I'm a green fan, but um, you can actually swap that out whether or not you have different different fiber optics uh, that you purchase from Brownells or Midways or whoever it is that you're going to purchase from with, okay? So the MSRP on this gun is six ninety nine, dollars um, and just know, 310, it's 9 millimeter. They do ship with magazines that still only fit 10 rounds. However, um, this wide body that is set up will fit any of our high capacity magazines. So you can even throw a 17 rounder in here. I'm here with Tyler with Silencer Shop and I wanted to, to bring something to light because as a firearms owner, I thought the process of buying a suppressor, doing an SBR or anything like that was a long, complicated, that you needed a law degree for and all that kind of stuff. But the fact of the matter is I just, I, I was stubborn. I didn't ask questions and then when I did, I finally got in contact with you guys at the Silencer Shop. Turns out it's not so hard. It was not so hard. As a matter yeah. of fact, it was so not so hard that uh, my girlfriend doesn't know this yet, but I got another suppressor. So <laughs> that'll be fun to explain when, uh, when it shows up in the safe. But as long as you bought it from me. So, yeah, right. So, uh, Tyler, I just kind of wanted to let, let people know, because like, I, I feel like there is still that fear of like, oh, yeah. I, I don't know what to expect when I buy a suppressor and the steps I have to go through and what I need to do. So you guys at Silencer Shop, I feel made it very easy between all your kiosks that you have set up everywhere, the, the app that you have, and then the website and, and your guys' support. That was the biggest thing was I like yes. called you guys and yes. all it took was a 20 minute conversation with someone. They were, they were patient, they were kind and informative. So uh, for those of those Good. out there that have thought about getting a suppressor, what's the steps? Silencershop.com, and I hate to give myself such a blatant plug right off the bat, but there's a ton of information up there, and like you said, that's what we do. We do the ATF, NFA process, tax stamps, trusts, what does this all mean, how does it all work? And then once you wrap your brain around the process and how you file for these things and doing fingerprints and passport style photo, it's not that complicated. But after that, then you also have to pick out your silencer and you get on the website and you look and it's a whole bunch of black metal tubes and they all look the same. And this one works on these calibers, but not those guns in those calibers. And it can, on the surface, be very confusing and overwhelming. But like you said, shoot us an email, give us a call, swing by one of these trade shows. We're at all of them. 
um, and talk to a human being. And as soon as you have someone explain this process to you, it's not that complicated. There are three basic categories of silencers and there's about 15 minutes worth of paperwork, which it's all digital now, right. um, that you have to do. And the paperwork is off to the ATF and whatever the ATF wait time is, which fluctuates throughout the year. Um, once that's done, you have your silencer. It wasn't that hard. And we've got different options for trusts, different options for silencers, different options for everything. It's not a one size fits all though. You kind of need to talk to someone the first time. And once you get through the first time, we've got all your information, it stays on file here. So when it's time for that second one, you're at home at 2 a.m. on your iPad in your underwear, sitting on the couch, you throw one in the shopping cart, select your dealer, we'll kick paperwork off, paperwork off to the ATF right away. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was so, I mean, it was like stupid simple. I was like, oh, I, I could have done this so long ago, but I didn't, right? Yes. And um, now for those that don't know, there's there's a couple ways you can get suppressors. One is as, in, as an individual, and then you guys have a traditional NFA trust, and then you've got the single shot trust, or yep. the unlimited single shot trust as well. Absolutely. So it, can you kind of explain, like, what's the difference between doing it as an individual versus doing it as a trust. Absolutely, and there's not a one size fits all to this, which is where I think a lot of that confusion and heartache comes from in getting into this is, you'll read something online, a forum post or something on Reddit or social media. <laughs> where everybody is an expert. Yes, and the keyboard <laughs> commandos know the right answer. There's not a right answer, it's different for everyone, which is why we have options, right? Mm -hmm. So if you register as an individual, super common uh, to do kind of in the previous 2016 uh, era, um, but then after that 41F hit and we get into politics later. But um, the basic idea of it is as an individual, if you file and own the silencer as an individual, you're the only person that can never be in possession of that silencer. If you go out to the range and the guy or girl standing next to you wants to shoot it, as long as you're there with it, you're fine. Um, but if your hunting buddy comes over 10 years from now, wants to borrow the silencer and take it away from you, he can't do that because it's registered to you, the individual. Cue the gun trust, um, where you can set up a trust and the trust goes off the ATF to own the silencer, but you own the trust. So when it comes back approved, the ATF has said, yes, the John Doe trust owns this silencer. You're John Doe, you can add Jane Doe, Jack Doe, whoever you want to the trust, they can use that item in your absence. You can also have that trust set up to go to someone, not to get morbid on you, in the event of your death, um, and make life a lot easier um, for someone after the fact, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, so I would say we do a bulk of the NFA paperwork in the country, and well over 80% of all of our customers register through a trust. It's not that we're trying to sell you something because it's something extra to sell you, it's because it's better. Um, and for that single shot trust, the beauty of it is the name of the trust named after the serial number of the item. It's good for just that one item. You're all right. Um, it's good for just that one item. It makes life a little easier if you don't want to try and get multiple people through the kiosk system, get fingerprints from multiple people. It just goes off you on it, comes back approved, and then you can do whatever you want with it for life. If that makes any sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Or you can set up the traditional one up front. There's a bit of a price difference, but the single shot unlimited, which is that kind of subscription service you talked about, and the traditional trust are the same price. Mm -hmm. For a reason, they're good for different people. For most people, the single shot's just easier. Right, right, yeah. absolutely. Now, as an individual, if you, if, you, if you get a suppressor as an individual, and then let's go ahead and stay on the morbid concept, you die. What happens to that suppressor there? It's a good question, and um, what I would say, kind of my canned response to that is, whoever the executor of the will is, needs to call ATF, NFA, Frontline, 304-616-4500. You're welcome, Martinsburg. Um, and give them a call and ask them how to do the transfer process. It's on ATF Form 5, typically, um, if it's going to another individual. But if you want to re-register it into a trust at that point, it gets a little hairy which is again why so many people register through a trust. It just gets rid of all of that hassle. Yeah, the trust is just set up to go to someone else. Now, and another thing that I think is very, very awesome that, that helps make the whole process a lot easier that you guys have are your kiosk setups, right? And, and at the kiosk, you can actually do your own fingerprints. Absolutely. We've got uh, almost 2,000 of them kind of spread all over the country at this point uh, in all the states that don't suck. <laughs> um, and uh, you can get on our website, you can find the dealer finder. We work a little bit like Amazon, I hate to point that out right now. Um, but you get on silencershop.com, we'll ping your IP address and set your closest dealer. But you can also go in there and shop around and find a dealer close to you, a dealer you always use, you know, whoever does on there on the map. It'll also show you all the dealers that have those kiosk locations. The beauty of those kiosk dealer locations is you walk in there the one time 
And inside, typically, if you're a slow typer, 15 minutes, you turn around and walk out and you've got all your stuff done. Your fingerprints, your demographic information, height, weight, hair color, eye color, all that good stuff. The never ever have I ever questions, right. never been convicted of this, never done that. Um, as well as uh, digital signature for the fingerprints, social security number, all that good stuff can all be done on the kiosk inside, well inside 15 minutes. And then the only time you need to leave home again is when you go pick up the silencer. You know, again, right now we're seeing about eight and nine months, uh, maybe 10 on ATF wait times right now. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, those kiosks are awesome. Also, we've got dealers or us that travel at all these trade shows too. So we've got customers here from all over the country that are registering here and doing their information on the kiosk right now. And then they'll go back to their home state, pick up at whatever dealer they selected too. So however you can find a kiosk, we're kind of all over the place at this point. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Tyler. I appreciate your time. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Silencer Shop, uh, be sure you check it out. I, I guarantee you, I, I thought I was not is, 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 n, 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 smart enough to figure it out, but the fact was, I was just too dumb to ask the question of, um, thank you, sir. Appreciate that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but um, yeah, I mean, the whole process, by, by calling you guys and just asking a few questions that I thought were stupid, uh, man, I went from being completely clueless they to were, absolutely They were, but you're not wrong for asking. <laughs> right. So, uh, guys, check it out, Silencer Shop. If you don't own a suppressor, I highly suggest you give it a try. It makes the shooting experience just so much more enjoyable. It's a different ballgame. Absolutely. And I say that all the time. People think I'm trying to sell them something, which, granted, I am. But I'm also not lying to you. It's completely right. different. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, the, the uh, going out and shooting an AR without a suppressor, and then you go and put a suppressor on, you shoot the same number. Like, the concussion blast is reduced. You don't have to worry about double plugging. I mean, it was just such a way more enjoyable experience. Absolutely. So, it's not um, just about sound. It's recoil reduction. It's taking the concussion out, the flinch response, all that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, guys, check them out. Silencer Shop. Tyler, thank you so much again for your time. And I'm here with a good friend of mine, Andrew, with Surefire. And what I wanted Andrew to kind of be able to talk to you out today is how do you buy a flashlight? Because like a lot of people just think, well, I bought a flashlight because when it's dark, I turn it on and now it's not dark anymore. But there is a little bit more that goes into it, whether or not it's it's the size, the brightness, the comfort level too. Because I think when you're carrying a flashlight all day long, like your hands go in and out of your pockets. And last thing you need is like this big bulky thing in the pocket that's interfering with everything, right? So let's talk a little bit about, yeah. you know, how do you buy a flashlight for, for everyday carry or, or whatever kind of purpose it is that you're looking for? Yeah, exactly. And I think I start there with most people when they ask what light they should get. Um, it's where are you going to carry it? So for some people, like if it's a duty light, they're going to be carrying it in a pouch on a belt. And maybe it's going to live in a glove box. It's going to live on a nightstand. So for that, the form factor, you don't really need it to be super slim. You don't need it to be, you know, it doesn't need to have a pocket clip. And so that would kind of be the, the first, you know, decision tree. Because um, like our Furies, our G2Xs, our 6PXs, they're all round lights that use either 123s or rechargeable 18650 batteries. Um, that'll be a better option for like a duty light or, you know, a glove box emergency type light. Um, but if you're going to be EDCing it, if you're going to be carrying it every day, then you're probably going to want something that's a little bit smaller form factor, something that's going to have a pocket clip on it that makes it a lot more conducive, obviously, to carrying in your pocket. Um, and then, you know, do you want, as far as beam pack goes, like what, what are your what are your preferences? Um, today, you know, there's a lot of people that want more candela, which is basically a representation of, of distance, uh, tighter, narrower, farther reaching beam pattern. Um, but most of our lights have what we call a hybrid beam pattern, which is like a hot spot in the middle and a nice amount of spill. We also have max vision beam patterns. This right here is a good example of that. So you can see it's a very wide, even beam pattern. Uh, max vision is really good for filling up a room, but it's not gonna give you a whole lot of throw. But for, you know, digging around close in, it's really, really nice to have a huge, wide uh, span of beam pattern. And then our brand new turbo series lights, those are the high candela lights, a very, very tight, narrow beam pattern. So it's, what are you gonna be doing with it? General purpose, you know, I like a hybrid beam pattern, like our G2Xs, our 6PXs. Um, nice hot spot, good amount of spill, kind of does it all. Uh, I've been carrying, personally, our Stiletto Pro. Most lights, you know, traditionally are round because of the battery, the form factor of the batteries. Um, with lithium ion, you can do a flat pack, which makes it really nice to carry in the pocket because it's thin. Mm. So it just feels like a pocket knife. Uh, it's still got a lot of output. This one's a thousand lumens. Um, also has a, a bezel switch where you can go low, medium, and then high, uh, and it's rechargeable. So super convenient if you're using it every day, you're not burning through batteries, spending a bunch of money on batteries. So um, that's kind of how I would decide, you know, I'd start with how you're carrying it. What are your intentions? Is it going in a pouch? Is it going in your pocket? 
Uh, and then from there, what do you want in a beam pattern? Um, what do you want in switching? And uh, in batteries, what do you want? Do you want it to be rechargeable? Um, some people prefer disposable. If you're using it out in the backwoods in the field, you want to be able to swap out batteries and not have right, to worry about it. You don't have an outlet just attached to your tent. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. So those are kind of the questions to ask yourself when you're looking at buying a light. Um, and obviously the answer for companies should be Surefire. <laughs> uh, no, I agree, and, and, and really because I, I have a, a ton of Surefire flashlights that I use, and like, awesome. like uh, they just last. I, I'm not the the nicest on my gear and equipment. Yep. I beat the crap out of it. I yep. drop it. I you know roll over with the car and all kind of stuff. And your guys' stuff just it keeps running. It's it's built tough. It's built to last. I mean, Jesus Christ, when you when you're putting them on rifles and handguns and it's taking those concussive blasts day after day, round after round, you need to make sure that it runs. And yeah. I I've never had an issue with a Surefire flashlight. So awesome. I would actually absolutely 100% give my stamp of approval on Surefire products, not just for the flashlights. I also have the monster suppressor that we, um, I won from you guys like seven years ago and finally got an ATF prison. Absolutely phenomenal suppressor. It does exactly what you said. We talk about there's there's less than a minute of angle shift and absolutely, I was, I was at a half inch angle uh, shift at 100 yards awesome. when I threw that suppressor. I mean, just great products. So where can people go to look up some more information about the products? and um, you know, be able to kind of pick and choose and, and see which flashlight they want to buy. Yep, surefire.com, all the information's there. Follow us on all the social media channels, Instagram, YouTube, whatnot, but uh, surefire.com is the best place to find all that information. Awesome, well Andrew, thank you so much for your thank time. You for really appreciate it. I'm here with Joshua at Next Belt. Now, uh, I, my personal YouTube channel, I did, I did a uh, review kind of of the belt that I got from these guys, but uh, and I absolutely love it. Okay, let me just make that perfectly clear. So I yeah. wanted to come by so um, they can kind of chat a little bit more about the product, what it's used for, um, which is a wide variety of things. If you if you wear a belt, then there's no reason not to have a yeah. nice belt, I think, in my opinion, right? So let's talk a little bit about some of um, what, what Next Belt has to offer, why it's a uh, a superior kind of product versus what's, you know, what you can buy at Walmart for eight yeah. bucks or whatever, right? Yeah, so yeah, uh, yeah. Let's, let's let's learn a little bit about Next Belt. So yeah. what, what, would you, what would you highlight as the important features of it? Yeah, so Next Belt basically is a 50 inch belt right here uh, you're able to cut it to size so you're able to customize the size on your end let's say like you're a 30 inch waist you would cut it at 34 you cut it reinsert the buckle now you got a custom belt but then we also include a ratchet system the ratchet system is quarter inch so you have four increments in between every inch uh, then when you ratchet it in you basically have a custom fit You'd be right in between your ratchet system right here, and you'd be able to ratchet out for comfort or ratchet in, you know. To be, so you had a heavy meal, and you want to relax a little, you're able to do that. Or let's say you're walking with your concealed carry, uh, and you go into your car, you're able to transition into a more comfortable, uh, you know, relaxed fit. Yeah, so basically that's... Yeah. Well, and you know the other thing about you guys is belt that I think is a good selling point for. And granted, I obviously I EDC, so yeah. I carry a Glock 19 when I when I do carry, and which can get heavy at times. And there have been belts that I've had owned in the past that over time yeah. get softer, they wear down, the rigidity. Yeah, you you yeah, kind of yeah. lose something. So when you go to draw, you you end up finding that you're like pant comes up halfway yeah. on your draw before it actually releases the gun. So yeah. um, let's talk about kind of the, the stiffness of your guys' belt yeah. and why you guys had to have a setup that way. Yeah, so the stiffness basically has, it's nylon on the inside and this one right here is leather on the outside. It's a pressed leather. Uh, but on the inside, it's a, like a Kydex mix. It's more flexible, but it's still durable. It makes it stiff enough for you to carry a firearm, but at the same time, you're able to um, rely on the belt from it not bending in or, or creasing or giving out like normal leather wood with the holes and other things. Uh, but it doesn't, doesn't stretch, it doesn't do any of that, and it locks within the mechanism of the ratchet system. And as you can see here, so they've actually got this system set up to where it looks like a regular everyday belt buckle, so there's nothing like yeah. weird looking about it. However, like I actually run the EDC belt buckle, and that was the first yeah. one that you had said. So um, what what is it that, uh, you know, if, if, can you explain to those people why the EDC belt buckle would be beneficial versus like one of the wider traditional looking belt buckle sizes yeah. or anything like that? So this one right here is called a Supreme Appendix. It's the one I showed you earlier. Same thing. Basically, the appendix is made for you to be able to put your um, your appendix carry uh, for right here. Um, and basically, it would allow you to be able to relax and have everything up front without showing too much of the buckle sticking out. Some buckles might feel like they might not be as, as concealed carry, and, but 
the certain buckles, you'll be able to be more flush. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and I, I like the small size of the belt because what it does is it kind of frees up some of the real estate. Yeah. So if you, if you need to make those micro adjustments, which is obviously part of the ratchet it system, is, yeah. it allows you to have a little bit more free play for that. Now, um, we talked about gun stuff because we're here at the NRA yeah. show, but you guys have, I mean, you've got, you've got the tactical stuff. That's very obvious, but you also have like dress belts for yeah. golfers and stuff like that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we started as a golf company. Uh, and then we started producing gun belts for uh, another company, uh, Blade Tech, and then we started doing our own thing after that. Um, and because of that, we started, we got into the gun industry more. But because of that, most of our belts are fashionable uh, before they even became tactical. Um, and so we brought the fashion into the tactical area. Uh, and our belts are very big in the golf industry. We're very big with the PGA. You know, all of like all of, most pros actually wear our belts. Uh, and then like even at for like the Riders Cup, we actually sponsored the whole uh, event. So all of the U.S. players were wearing our belts. Uh, next belts for the PGA, you know, Riders Cup, stuff like that. Well, there you go. So those of you that like or don't like golf, then, you know, either use that however you need to. <laughs> um, now, let's let's talk a little bit, like, because I, I find these belts, one, I, I like running them personally. Yeah. And because I like running them means that I want all my friends and family to yeah. have them and stuff. So yeah. is there anything people can do with your belt, either through your website or anything like that, where, like, they can almost, like, kind of make it customized like maybe they got a bachelor party coming up or yeah. someone's you know 50th birthday and they want to give us a gift yeah. what, what kind of options are there to so, make them super yeah. customizable yeah so we have like in-house laser so any belt that we have that's basically flat and we're able to laser on we're able to create a custom belt for you we also have like boxes that we're able to gift for you know, like groomsmen or anything you want uh the laser edge could be like very detailed and we have like graphic designers in-house that are able to create a custom logo or you send us your logo and we'll be able to vector it and then we'll be able to create something for you customized uh with your brand on it yeah. perfect well guys I, I can tell you again i've been running my belt now for at least six months um, absolutely no complaints about it. Like you said, it's, it's almost super, uh, it's, it's very adjustable. It's very easy to make those adjustments. Even like, I don't have to take my gun completely out of my pants to make yeah. the adjustment with the belt and then put it, like, it's literally, you push the button, yeah. let it loose out, or you just push it in and it cinches yeah. back down. So, uh, where, where is it that they can find any information about you guys' Yeah, product? so we're on nextbelt.com or you can always give us a phone call. But yeah, nextbelt.com. Perfect. Well, there you go. Thank you guys so much. I uh, hope you guys found this inf uh, information useful. What's going on, guys? My name is Nils Jonasson, and I'm here at NRA with John McLean, and we're checking out the Canik SFX Rival S. The Rival S is the steel frame version of last year's Rival, which I won six national championships and a world title with. But now, the frame is made out of steel. What does that mean? Well, it allows the recoil of the gun to be absorbed more by the gun rather than by the shooter. So it absorbs a lot of that recoil, so you have to work maybe not so hard to shoot fast and accurate. That John McLean? Great. That was great. Uh, <laughs> welcome. To, well, that, that's a great intro for the open action uh, post here. I am here at the Canik booth with my good friend, Nils Jonasson. Everyone just kind of knows if you see him, more than likely you see me trailing behind him like a little puppy and all that kind of stuff. But um, as, as we talked about, we've got the brand new uh, Canik Rival S out here, um, which is the steel frame version. Now, Nils, um, when, when we get into the, the competition world, and I hate to get in competition shooting because that's kind of what I try and stick away from, but that's kind of your forte and whatnot. Um, when, when we talk about bringing brand new shooters in, cost is always something that is like, a, oh gosh, like I, I remember when I was first got in, the idea of spending seven, eight, nine hundred dollars on a gun was like, whoa, that's a lot. But you know, then you got to realize like, well, the gun's going to last 10 years. So in reality, that's like $80 per year that you're actually spending and sure. investing into a firearm, right? But I feel like you guys have something great with the Canik line of pistols especially for that brand new shooter, because this is a gun that obviously performs very well in your hands, which means that anyone that actually goes out, trains, practices, can execute and become very proficient with the firearm. But your guys' price point for the package that you get is absolutely insane, right? So um, for that brand new shooter that wants to get into shooting, would you suggest going straight to a steel frame or would you maybe suggest going to a polymer? What, what's your mindset on something like that? So the steel frame is going to make that recoil impulse softer right but you don't need the steel frame in order to be competitive um the steel is going to be a couple of extra hundred dollars so if that's if that fits your budget awesome if it doesn't fit your budget the polymer frame is a great option 
one thing that we include with both the steel frame and the regular rival is a holster out of the box. So not only do you get a pistol, several magazines, all of your optics compatibility, but we include a holster from the factory that I personally use in competition. So we didn't want the competitor or the, uh, the gun enthusiast to go out, buy the gun, and then like, I'm gonna shoot a match. Now I have to go buy a holster, now I have to go buy you know, like all this extra stuff. It's included in the package from the factory. So we try to do that to not only include more stuff for the competitor or for the gun enthusiast, but also to keep those prices low, right? Like mm -hmm. you don't need a ton of money to get into competitive shooting. Right, absolutely, for sure. Um, now, when, when someone were to buy something like the Rival S here, um, what kind of divisions, because competition shooting, obviously there's different divisions. You got sure. production, you got limited, you got now limited optics as a provisional and stuff. This gun kind of covers like quite a few divisions it just does. as it once platform. So, so what are the divisions that it covers, and then what do you have to change about the firearm to make it legal for those divisions? Gotcha. So USPSA just released a new division called uh, Limited Optics. Uh, this configuration with the red dot and the magwell would be totally fine for that. Um, take the magwell off and you'd be legal for carry optics division in USPSA. You can put the magwell back on and now you're legal for carry optics division in IDPA. You could take the magwell off again and the red dot off and you could shoot production division in USPSA. You could also shoot SSP in IDPA with this pistol. You can pop that magwell back on, keep the iron sights, and now you can shoot enhanced service pistol in IDPA or limited division in USPSA. So it's a pretty versatile little package. Yeah, and it's it, it's kind of it's kind of comical to have to know like when can I have the magwell on, when can I have the magwell off, when, you know. But, yeah. But that, again, that's just one of the things that I absolutely love about you guys. Is when you guys, well, it helps when you've got a top level competitive shooter giving the input of things that can be a benefit. It helps. Things that maybe you can trim the fat off a little bit, right? And um, man, I mean, I, I also think that the trigger on your guys' gun out of the box is one of the best, uh, absolutely by far. So, so for me personally, yeah, absolutely. It's, don't be wrong. I love you and all. You're, you're a good friend and whatnot, but um, the, the gun is pretty phenomenal, especially for the price point that you guys get it set up at. And then the fact that you're able to cover so many different divisions. I mean, it's an absolute great firearm for that beginner shooter to get into, to learn about the sport. But it's also a damn good firearm for the elite shooter because it runs, it's accurate, oh, the yeah. accessories are out there. I mean, it's... Well, and for anybody watching this, I would highly recommend if you've never felt a trigger on a Canik firearm, go to your local gun store, find a Canik, whether it's the Mete or the SFX Rival S or the Palmer frame version, the regular Rival. Pick it up, play with it a little bit, feel the trigger, dry fire the trigger, because at the end of the day, you could have a $10,000 gun, and if your trigger isn't performing, you're not gonna be very accurate. But if your trigger, and your trigger manipulation of the pistol itself is where you want it to be, then you can be so much more accurate. So go ahead and check out Canic Firearms and try the trigger for yourself. Let me know what you think. I absolutely second that. I already did a video on my personal YouTube talking about uh, your guys', uh, I think it was the Elite SC. Okay. And again, that, that trigger out of the box was just absolutely insane. It's one of my favorites. Um, I mean, every time you guys come out with something, it seems like you guys are definitely growing and, and trying to kind of push the envelope, but uh, uh, the rival S Canic guys, uh, Canic lines of firearms is absolutely fantastic. You know, Rock Island's good too, but uh, Canic, you're diff different kind of platform and whatnot. But, um, well, so. and another thing, I was talking about adding as much value we, as we can in the package for the shooter. Why don't you follow me over here and I'll show you exactly what's included from the factory on this new rival S. Come on this way. The Canic rival S ships from the factory in this hard-sided Pelican style case, lockable. It's two-tiered, so you've got your extra magazines, your pistol cavity, your extra back strap, so a small or a medium and a large if you've got bigger hands. It includes a tool kit, so different, different fiber optic rod colors are in here, so if you want to change your fiber optic front sight from red to green, you can in here. It also comes with a tool kit for, as far as like screwdrivers and extra screws, for your optics plates, which are included on the second level here. So all of your most popular red dot sights from small, medium to extra large will fit on the SFX Rival S from the factory. And here's that holster I was talking about that's included from the factory. 
So, so that you literally get, have an entire package where you can not only just become a brand new competition shooter, but you can travel as a brand new competition shooter yes. to these different matches because this is a flight legal case where you've got holes to Yeah, it's lockable, it's non friable absolutely. I mean, again, it's hard to beat that as far as the bang for the buck. So uh, not to get, you know, punny with the bang for the buck. Band, and we are here in the Sightmark Pulsar booth with Kevin here. And, you know, something that I've, I've started to get into, uh, as most people know, I started hunting a few years ago. And there's just there's so many more aspects to hunting, not just in the daytime, but also nighttime. And that opens up a whole new world of information and products and stuff, including night vision and thermals. So uh, Kevin here is going to kind of explain to us some of the products that they make here and also kind of like the, the good, better, best, what do you need versus what do you want when you're looking for things like that? Because there's a lot of information out there and not to get me wrong, there's a lot of experts on the internet. Um, but I figured I'd talk to someone that actually sells them, talks about them, uses them for a living. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over. So Kevin, what is someone at an entry level just looking to maybe just start that journey into the night time, you know, when things go bump in the night and they want to go bumping back. Uh, what is it that you got for us for the entry level kind of so, person? So, uh, you know, you and I were talking a few minutes ago about uh, about hunting, right? And there's a, and there's several types of hunting or pursuits, right? And so really, um, you know, a lot of the products that we use, whether they're rifles or bows or optics, I mean, this is purpose-driven stuff, right? right so absolutely. And I've been doing this stuff for a long time, hunting a lot. 90% of my bow hunting is at night time. And so it really comes down to what kind of a what kind of pursuits are you looking for, and whether you want to use uh, bows or guns or right? So, um, on its face, we're looking at hunting where you're looking at you know one or two animals in more traditional style hunting, or in Texas where we have three million pigs and we're in eradication mode, right? Right. And so, if I'm hunting individually, I might, like I said, use my bow, and you know, I'm up in a tree stand or ground blind at two o'clock in the morning. And I'm using high intensity uh, colored LED lights or laser uh, illuminators with uh, remote pressure switches on the front of my riser and, and lighted knocks and all of that. Um, but if I'm just looking for one and I want to hunt with a rifle uh, or even a crossbow, then I might use something like this, especially getting into it, because this is kind of say I don't want to I want to be careful. I don't want to use the word entry level because it's a really uh, high quality premium optic. But when we're talking about price points, this is kind of where it does begin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this, this scope right here is a digital rifle scope and it's a true 24 hour scope. So it's full color HD during the daytime, but then you push a button and go to digital night vision. Right. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, with, with our IR illuminator, it comes with the IR illuminator. You're looking at about a 300 yard detection range at nighttime. Uh, and also has built-in video that goes to a micro US, US uh, uh, excuse me, a micro SD card. Which we all know, if you if you didn't get it on video, then it didn't happen. That's right. Yeah, right. Yeah, especially bow hunters, right? If you don't have video or if you don't have a picture, I was like, oh, I killed a great boar last night. They're like, where's the picture? And like, well, I was by myself, so I don't get a picture. And then the bow hunters are notorious for saying it didn't happen, right? Right, exactly. Um, but yeah, it does have built-in video. Uh, and it's, so it's a true 24-hour scope, right? With 300-yard detection range. And this actually comes in two models. So we have a 2 to 16, which is really great for say small game or hogs where you're shooting them close at closer range. Mm -hmm. um, then we have a four to 32 that people like to use when they're say hunting coyotes or hunting a little bit further away, right? Right, right. What that boils down to is what your field of view is, right? Mm -hmm. So if I'm closer and I'm shooting pigs, I do want that wider field of view, so I, I need a lower base magnification. But these run about, probably you're gonna find them for seven, $800. So if you put it on, say, a regular, say, uh, AR, maybe even better if it's chambered in something like a Grendel or something like that. But you can put one of those together for, you know, six, eight hundred dollars and have something like this. You're probably going to be into this complete setup for about fifteen hundred bucks, which is not terrible. I mean, uh -huh. there, there are way more expensive setups that you could get. And oh, some I have them. Yeah. Getting them, right. So. <laughs> so now. So. So once you've established what you want to do, so. This is, I think, better geared for individual hunting where you're going out and you're looking for one or two coyotes, you're looking for one or two pigs, maybe you're stand hunting, you're still hunting, or you're spot and stock hunting, but you're only after one or two. That's different than eradication hunting, right? right. So what I would say, somebody who's getting into eradication hunting where we're just trying to go out there and, and take as many as we can and help farmers and ranchers out, a lot of us are moving into the thermal world, right? And so the thermal is a lot more expensive 
Uh, and actually, not even that bad. I mean, right now we're looking at a base a baseline of probably about twenty five hundred dollars. So, still less expensive than some of the long range day scopes that I use when I'm right absolutely shooting right. Yeah. Um, but they're moving more from digital night vision to thermal, I think, because that price point. Now they're able to afford those. And that's perfect for eradication style hunting because here you're shooting with a more muted palette. But when you're shooting with thermal, um, the objects that you're shooting at absolutely glow. Mm -hmm. So you nothing hides from thermal. Right, right. Yeah, we were just kind of playing so around with that. So what I would say is now that we're moving, we're talking about some eradication style hunting, we should walk around the other side of the booth and look at some of the Pulsar product too. But having said that, if people do want to know more about this particular scope or some of the other products under our Sightmark brand, they just need to go to sightmark.com for that. Okay, perfect. So sightmark.com cool. for the digital night vision optic yep. options for those that... Uh, we're going to say entry level, but I mean, obviously, if you're getting into it, there's nothing entry about your setup. But uh, yeah, let's head over to the Pulsar side and you'll show us some thermal stuff. Cool. Yeah. All right. So we went from the Sightmark side, which was the digital night vision yeah. stuff over here to the Pulsar side, which is kind of more thermal. And uh, just just real quick, what's the difference between night vision versus thermal? Uh, so digital night vision will cast out IR illumination or use ambient light and bring that light in to create a uh, the image on your display, right? Generational night vision will pass it through a uh, photocathode multi-channel plate and basically explode these light particles into in exponentially more light particles uh, that is used to create that image where digital night vision will take those light particles, convert them to electrodes, and then process those into the image that you see on your display, right? So you're basically casting out our illumination and and bring all that light back in to be processed into, new, into an image. Well, thermal doesn't work like that. Thermal sends out a sensor array to detect infrared radiation, which is heat, or differences in temperature, and brings that information back into the unit. So instead of casting IR illumination out, it's reaching out and it's grabbing out, grabbing infrared, infrared radiation and bring that information back. Mm, okay, so yes, yeah, very, very kind of different use, setup. So. Okay, perfect. So hopefully I, hopefully I said that in layman's terms. <laughs> I well, I think it makes sense, though, for sure. During the headlight look, right when I tell when I start talking about infrared radiation versus infrared uh, illumination. Wait, what'd you say? And <laughs> right. So yeah, one casts that IR illumination out, and the other one will go out and grab that that infrared radiation and bring that that information back to be processed. And that's where we get into the thermals. Right? That's where we get into the thermals, right? So thermals are completely lights out, stealth black, no IR illumination, no red glow, no nothing. I mean, you're completely blacked out when you're out using thermal imagery. So when you're using night vision stuff, essentially anyone else that has night vision capability would be able to see your beam going across, illuminating things and stuff like they that. They could see your IR illumination, uh, but also depending on the type of, IR type of IR illuminator that you're using, you, they may see a faint red glow from your device. Mm, okay. With thermal, you're completely blacked out. There's nothing. The only thing they might see is a little bit of light coming from your display that's flooding out of your eye box. Okay. So uh, most of us, if we can get into thermal, that's what we prefer to use. Like I said, when you digital night vision, you still have kind of a grayscale palette or a black and white palette. It's very muted. And sometimes you may not see things unless they're actually moving, right? They always mm. say the best type of camouflage is not move. Yep. Right? You could be in the best camouflage ever, and as soon as you move, you're busted, and I can see you. And digital might be the same way. It's a very muted color palette, and if something is perfectly still, I might not notice it. Especially if I'm not catching the glare from the eyes. When you cast out that IR illumination, it's basically, it's a flat light. It's like a flashlight, right? So you're actually casting illumination out, so you'll actually see eyes glow. But if for some reason you don't see the eyes glow and, and the animal's not moving, there could be an animal 40, 50 yards in front of you that you won't detect. You won't, you won't know it's there. Mm -hmm. Thermal doesn't do that. Thermal's looking for temperature variances. And if something out there with the temperature variance, whether it's moving or not, if it's out there, it's going to glow. There's no mistaking that there's something out there with a heat signature. So um, nothing hides from thermal. Mm -hmm. So that's why we elect to do that. The good thing is that thermal is much more affordable than it was before. So we looked at the Wraith 4K uh, mini digital rifle scope over there that runs probably about $800. Um, but people are getting into thermal now for, you know, as low as $1,500, depending on the type of product that they're looking for. Like this one right here, this is a little handheld scanner. This is the, the Axion XM30. And this one runs about 1500 bucks. 
Uh, it's pocket size, but it's pretty powerful. It has a 1,400-yard detection range. It'll pick up an adult-sized heat signature at 1,400 yards, but it's only 1,500 bucks. Okay. Right? So it definitely opens up a lot more possibilities when it comes to, like, spot and stock kind of situations when not in low-light settings. And so somebody who's kind of bridging the gap, they may run something like that Wraith right Digital Rifle Scope and use this as a scanner. Mm, right? Okay. What I try to tell people not to do is try to not use your rifle scope as a scanner because nobody wants you out there flagging in the middle of the night. Right, <laughs> right, right, exactly. Um, and the more important thing to do when you're out there looking, you know, for us down in Texas and we're doing um, uh, eradication hunts is we're scanning crop fields, right? So it's actually more important for me to use a better imager when I'm scanning crop fields than it is when I'm actually on the crop field getting ready to shoot. Because I may be looking for pigs 800 yards across the field. I need one of these. When I'm ready to shoot, I'm inside of 100 yards. Mm, okay. Right? Yeah. So I would say make sure you get a, a good scanner. Now, if you're only going to buy one thermal, I would tell them then buy a thermal rifle scope because you can still use that as a thermal, as a thermal scanner. Um, I keep one in my backpack when I bow hunt. Right? Mm. But then you could also mount it onto a rifle and it's... It's a thermal rifle scope, right? This is not recoil rated. It will never be a rifle scope. Oh, okay. But a thermal rifle scope can be used as a monocular, and then when you're ready to shoot with it, you could mount it onto a firearm and use it use it as, as is intended as a rifle scope. Right, right. But anyway, so this is about $1,500. So when we look at this and we look at something, say, at that lower price point on the thermal rifle scope size, uh, rifle on the thermal rifle scope side, we look at something like the Talion XQ38. So this one right here has a 384 sensor, it has a 1500 yard detection range, uh, it has built in video Wi Fi, all the, the features that people look for in, in our Pulsar brand the picture in picture, the eight color palette, the multiple color reticles and reticle styles, it's all in here. But this one runs about $2,500. Okay. Right? And it's still a very useful scope. I mean, 1,500 yards detection range, and most of your shot's going to be inside of 100 yards, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's more than enough, but also doesn't break your bank. Mm -hmm. So we have that one. But then we have some diehard guys like me that really appreciate thermal technology and kind of like the techies, right? I'm always moving up, moving up, moving up, moving up. So I start looking at the flagship stuff. I'm like, what's over there? So I'm like... Well, that's pretty cool, the Thermion Duo, right? So this one runs about 2,500, but this one runs about six grand. So quite a significant jump, but it sounds like you're also gonna get way more uh, bang yeah. for your buck. Well, the cool thing about thermal technology is that it holds its value, value really well, right? I kind of equate it to firearms, right? So I might use a thermal for a couple of years, I'll turn around and I'll sell it, and I'm selling it for pretty close to what I bought it for. So mm -hmm. I always tell people, it's a little bit of a leap to get into the game, but once you're in the game, you stay in the game. Okay. Right? You're never going to have to redo that complete spend. When I want to upgrade, I may be out, you know, $500 or $1,000 or something like that, but I'm not coming up with all that money again. So. Right, right. Okay. And it's still there unless you decide that you're going to, you know, get a thermal for the, another person. It's different. But if you're just upgrading, the point is that your money's never gone. Mm -hmm. Right. Once you make your large purchase, the money is still there. So this right here, this is the Thermion Duo. This one has a 640 sensor with a 17 micron pixel pitch. Uh, it has a uh, 25 millikelvin NETD sensitivity, so the image quality is really pristine in this. It is a true thermal rifle scope, but at the same time, it also has full color 4K uh, daytime mode. So you can run this as a daytime scope. It's gonna look similar to what you would see if you're looking through a traditional rifle scope. Full color, 4K, has built-in video, Wi-Fi, everything else. But when you wanna run thermal, when the sun goes down, whatever it is, you just hit a button and go over to thermal, and now you're in thermal with a 2,000 yard detection range. Okay, so I mean, you, you, it really becomes kind of an all-in-one, um, which is very rare to be able to find a product that can be an all-in-one. Well, yeah, but, and actually uh, on the thermal side, this is an industry first. Oh, okay. So, yeah, we're the first one to do it on the thermal side. So, that's the Thermion Duo. And then we have one more on the upper end side, which is the scope that I actually hunt with. This is my favorite. And this is the Thermion 2 LRF XP50 Pro. This one also has a 640 sensor, 17 micron pixel pitch, 
uh, in a 25 millikelvin NETD sensitivity, a 2,000 yard detection range, built-in video, Wi-Fi, all the cool stuff. Battery life on these two is probably between the internal lithium ion rechargeable battery and the external lithium ion rechargeable battery, you're looking at probably a good eight, nine hours of battery life. Um, and this, this one also has a laser range finder. Oh. So laser range finder is really good because one of the things that you lose when you look at the thermal is depth perception. Yeah. You don't know if you're shooting football at 40 yards or if you're shooting big pigs at 200 yards, right? Unless you know the ground that you're hunting. So this is really uh, convenient because it's built in. It has an 800-yard detection range. It's accurate to plus or minus one yard, and it works in zero light. So as people that have been around the block with rangefinders for a while, like me as a bow hunter, rangefinders have always worked based on reflectivity, mm -hmm. right? Kind of like daylight or sun reflecting off an animal's hide or something. That's where you get the best uh, distance detection. Right. And they absolutely suck when you need them to work the most, right? As a bow hunter, I'm at dawn and dusk. That's when go times are, right? Right, exactly, when yeah. When there's the least amount of sunlight. So the effectiveness of laser range finders has always been a little dicey. But this is using a sensor array uh, and, and detecting that heat signature out there at distance and giving that information back to you, which means that that laser range finder is working when there's absolutely zero light. Doesn't okay. need any light at all, doesn't need reflectivity. It's going to go out there, bounce off something, give the information. You know that thing is 342 yards, and I need to walk another 250 yards to get a good shot on it. So, Got it. It kind of ends the uh, ends the uh, the problem of uh, shooting footballs at 40 yards that we're shooting big pigs at 150. <laughs> you know what you're shooting you know, before you right, you right, yeah. walking. You, you so. know the distance, so you know kind of the, uh, you have a little bit better uh, – judgment of what size thing it is that you're shooting and all kinds yeah. of stuff. And, so. I, and honestly, when, you, when, you, when you're hunting at nighttime, and I'll be real for a second, there's an inherent danger to that. Um, you know, you, sometimes you're working on it, you're walking on uneven ground. There are other things out there, um, you know, on the ground that you may not know is there. I mean, uh, and you're dealing with other people out there with firearms and thermals or digital night vision. And so, you know, safety is number one. Um, you you want to know what's out there, what's in front of you. Um, and you want to know what you're shooting, right? We're, Absolutely. we're not out there to shoot livestock. <laughs> we're not out there to shoot cows or goats or donkeys or anything like that. We're out there to shoot bobcats, coyotes, um, varmints, barrel hogs. Um, so you, you've really got to know what you're, what you're walking into and what you're shooting. So Absolutely. Um, this one right here will actually run at also about 6,000. All of these right here have multiple color reticles. Uh, think uh, 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 they also have first focal plane reticles. I think two first focal plane reticles. I killed a nil guy down in South Texas with uh, something similar to this one. It was a Trail 2 XP50 LRF. I pulled up a first focal plane reticle. I knew that my dope, my uh, my dope was 2.5 mil holdover at 500 yards with my 300 Winchester short mag. So I zoomed in, used my first focal plane reticle, held at 2.5 bills, and shot that nail guy, and, and it dropped. So there's you guys get to some... hunt such cool stuff down there in Texas, man. Jesus. <laughs> yeah, the nail guy are pretty <laughs> cool, and, and they're great eating, right? But the cool thing is that, you know, we have stuff like that. So if you've got to take a longer shot and you know you're dope, you actually have first focal plane reticles in here that you can use to, to make sure that you're taking good, confident shots. So, nice. And there's so many different applications, right? So... Not only great for night hunting, um, but even these right here, we got guys using these on uh, waterways to detect hazards in water and boats running without lights on. Mm, we okay. got guys on the border, border patrol using those, farmers and ranchers using those, um, firemen, law enforcement, first responders. You think about fugitive recovery, search and rescue. Absolutely, yeah. Be, being, I, I did EMS for eight years in Vegas. We did a couple search and rescue operations, and yeah, I mean, to have something like like thermal would have been great because you're staring up the side of a mountain, being like, "Where?" They said they're by a bush. There's yeah. 400 bushes up there. What the hell, you yeah. know? So it, it and definitely made it more easier. My wife has found out that she could tell me where air is getting in through our door jams and stuff, and. I've got to shorten the, in the light switch in the bathroom. So there you go, guys. There's your excuse. Tell your wife or girlfriend, like, babe, with this, you could find leaks in the house. Yeah, That's I actually the I had to example. put my handheld in the gun safe because she keeps forgetting my gun safe combo. So I'm like, she has no access to the handheld anymore. <laughs> I took it there away. There you go. Anything you want to add? What Kevin said. <laughs>
<laughs> Perfect. Well, there you go. Hey. If, if you want to learn more about this stuff, uh, we also have a Digex uh, C50 that's also for full color and uh, digital night vision with a 600 yard detection range. It's uh, it's uh, a little bit more than the uh, the Wraith uh, that we looked on the Sightmark side, but that is under the Pulsar brand. And you can learn more about that and all of these that we just looked at at PulsarNV.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Kevin, well, for your time. You, John, I, I, I really appreciate, appreciate it. it. I hope you guys fun. found that information very, very useful because I know I learned a whole bunch more that I didn't know when I walked in the booth. And uh, I'm very, very excited about getting into the idea of night vision and thermal for, for all my hunting adventures and stuff. But uh, stay tuned for the next episode, Open Action with John McLean, presented by Arms Corps as uh, we walk around the NRA show in 2023.